Hello, everybody. This is Margareta Harris in Geneva on this 24th of August, uh, f speaking to you from the Geneva WHO headquarters and welcoming you to the, our global COVID-19 press conference today. Today, we're going to have a focus on the ACT Accelerator, so please get your questions ready for on this very interesting and important subject. Um, as always, Dr. Tedros, our Director General, will address you first, then I will open the floor to questions. Joining Dr. Tedros to answer questions today are, in the room, Dr. Mariangela Shimao, our Assistant Director General for Access to Medicines, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, our Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Bruce Aylwood, our Senior Advisor um, to the Director General, who's leading the work on the Accelerator, and joining us virtually is Dr. Mike Ryan, um, the Executive Director for our Emergencies Program, and we hope Dr. Sumia uh, Swaminathan, yes, she has joined, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, our Chief Scientist. As always, this briefing is being translated simultaneously into the six official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish, and Russian, plus Portuguese and Hindi. But I've got some very good news for Arabic speakers, Arabic and Hindi speakers. The Zoom has been upgraded, so the language button is the correct button. You simply press Arabic. However, if you're not seeing it, you will need to upgrade your Zoom. So I'm telling you that now if you're having problems. So now without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Margareta. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Last week, I sent a letter to all member states requesting them to join the vaccine arm of the ACT Accelerator. I'm pleased to announce that as of today, 172 countries are now engaging with the COVAX Global Vaccines Facility, which has both the largest and most diverse COVID-19 vaccine portfolio in the world. At present, there are nine vaccines that are part of this dynamic portfolio, which is constantly being reviewed and optimized to ensure access to the best possible range of products. Even now, discussions are ongoing with four more producers, and a further nine vaccines are currently under evaluation for the longer term. The facility is critical the critical mechanism for joint procurement and pooling risk across multiple vaccines so that whatever vaccine is proven to be safe and effective, all countries within the facility will be able to access them. Most importantly, it is the mechanism to enable a globally coordinated rollout. This is in the interests of all countries even those that have invested with individual manufacturers independently. We're working with vaccine manufacturers to provide all countries that join the effort timely and equitable access to all vaccines licensed and approved. This doesn't just pool risk. It also means that prices will be kept as low as possible. New research outlines that global competition for vaccine doses could lead to price spiking exponentially in comparison to a collaborative effort such as COVAX facility. It would also lead to a prolonged pandemic as only a small number of countries would get most of the supply. Vaccine nationalism only helps the virus. The world has so far invested 12 trillion US dollars in keeping economies moving. Investing in the COVAX facility is the fastest way to end this pandemic and ensure a sustainable economic recovery. Through the allocation framework, COVAX will ensure that low, middle, and high-income countries all receive the vaccine in a timely way as soon as there is supply of a safe and effective vaccine. The success of the COVAX facility hinges not only on countries signing up to it, but also filling key funding gaps for both the research and development work and to support lower income economies within the facility. 
Our only way out of this pandemic is together. Initially, when there will be limited supply, it's important to provide the vaccine to those at highest risk around the world. This includes health workers as they are on the front lines in this pandemic and critical to saving lives and stabilizing the overall health system. It also includes people over 65 years old and those with certain diseases that put them at higher risk of dying from COVID-19. As supply increases, the next stage of the vaccine rollout would be expanded based on an assessment of each country's vulnerability to the virus. A number of vaccines are now in the final stage of clinical trials, and we all hope we will have multiple successful candidates that are both safe and effective. In order to be able to secure enough doses to roll out the vaccines, the next step for the partnership is for countries to make binding commitments in support of the COVAX facility. While we're grateful for the funds already committed towards the COVAX facility, more is urgently needed to continue to move the portfolio forward. The goal of the mechanism is to deliver at least 2 billion doses of safe, effective vaccines by the end of 2021. As governments invest trillions into economic stimulus, the COVAX facility offers a huge return on investment. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and as I said last week, together we can do it. While investing collectively in research and development on vaccines, we need to also use the tools at hand that we have now to suppress this virus. As governments hone their track and trace systems to test, isolate and care for patients, and trace and quarantine their contacts, everyone can play their part. If we all physically distance, clean our hands regularly, wear masks and keep informed, we can collectively break the chains of transmission. Do it all, do it all now. Communicating challenges and solutions has and will continue to be key to ending this pandemic. More than 4 million people have enrolled in our training courses through the openwho.org online learning platform. WHO is partnering with the World Federation of Science Journalists to accurately communicate the intricate science as it evolves. Through our regional offices, WHO has organized webinars in multiple languages for journalists to counter misinformation and a massive open online course for journalists covering the pandemic was created through a partnership between WHO, UNESCO and the Knight Center for Journalism at the University of Texas, Austin. More than 9,000 journalists from 162 countries enrolled. This online training was delivered in English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, and will soon be available in Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and Hindi. More information about these online courses is available on our website. We're learning new things about this virus every day, and journalists are critical to helping news communicate that information to the public in a way that saves uh, lives. We will continue to promote science, solutions, and solidarity because we believe to our core that we do it best when we do it together. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. I'll now open the floor to questions. Remember, because we have so many people online, please restrict your questions to one question. Mm -hmm. And remember, you can ask your questions in any of the six UN languages uh, uh, and plus Portuguese. And now the first person on the list is Jason Gale. We're going to Australia. Jason Gale from Bloomberg. Uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thanks, Margaret. Um, apologies, my question is not directly related to COVAX. Um, 
Researchers at the University of Hong Kong are reporting today that uh, a reinfection in a 33-year-old immunocompetent Hong Konger um, 142 days after a symptomatic infection. Uh, the subsequent infection was caused by a different virus as confirmed by genome sequencing, and it was asymptomatic. Uh, this is the first documented case of reinfection that I'm aware of out of more than 23 million COVID-19 cases. How should we interpret this finding and what are the implications for herd immunity and for vaccination? Thanks. Thanks very much uh, for the question. Um, I just uh, got a hold of the uh, press release that was uh, provided by Hong Kong U. Um, so I had a quick look at that. I think what we need to, from the very beginning, we've been talking about um, when people are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, and that our expectation is that people who are infected with this virus develop an immune response. What we are learning about infection is that people do uh, develop an immune response. And uh, what is not completely clear yet is for how long, how strong that immune response is and for how long that immune response lasts. There's very good data coming out from research studies which are being conducted all over the world that are looking at this immune response for people who have had a mild infection, people who have had asymptomatic infection, people who have had severe infection. And we're seeing that they do develop uh, an, an immune response and most people do. Uh, um, and so what we understand from the press release is that this may be an example of reinfection. Um, and if you remember last week, I was asked about this and I had said that in cases like this, it would be good if sequencing could be done. And in a place like Hong Kong, um, where they have very strong facilities, they can do that. And in fact, they have done. I understand from the press release that there's 24 nucleotide difference between the first virus and the second virus. What I think is really important is we put this into context. As you outlined in the question, yourself, um, there's been more than 24 million cases uh, reported to date, and we need to look at something like this on a population level. And so um, it's very important that we document this uh, and that in countries that can do this, if sequencing can be done, that would be very, very helpful. Um, but we need to not jump to any conclusions um, to say, if, even if this is the first documented case of reinfection, it is possible, of course, because with our experience with other human coronaviruses um, and the MERS coronavirus and the SARS-CoV-1 coronavirus, we know that people have an antibody response for some time, but it may wane. What we know specifically about immune response for SARS-CoV-2 is that there are a number of studies underway following the same individuals over time. These are called longitudinal studies, which follow the same individual at monthly time periods or, or every few months. Remember, we're eight months into this pandemic, and so these studies are still continuing. From the longitudinal studies that are underway, not all of them are published yet, um, we do see a strong antibody response that stays, that, that stays at that same level. There are some cross-sectional surveys that have been recently published that look at the same population over time, not the same individuals, but the same group of people from the same population. And there, it was some suggestion that there may be a slight decline or waning in immunity. Again, we really need these studies to be conducted so that we really understand what this immune response looks like. But I don't want people to be afraid. Um, we need to ensure that you know people understand uh, that when they are infected, even if they have a mild infection, that they do develop an immune response. In this particular case, it's very important that we look, and I haven't read the study, so I don't have the answer to this yet, um, to see if this individual developed a neutralizing antibody response, which is what will protect from reinfection. Um, so still a lot of work underway, really good studies that are underway, but it's great to see documentation and, and, and these good studies and these being shared. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, for the next question, we're going to Malta, uh, to Monique in the Malta newsroom. Monique, could you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Good afternoon. Hi, it's Monique. Um, my question is, what is the World Health Organization's view if a vaccine is found? Would it be mandatory for everyone? Thank you very much for the question um, about uh, vaccines and their use going forward. Um, the, uh, the question was specifically whether or not there would be a requirement for vaccination. And obviously, immunization policy and requirements are in the national domain, and so those decisions would be made uh, at the national level. But um, clearly, 
the uh, what we're looking for here is the greatest possible acceptance of a vaccine and and, and that vaccine seeking behavior so um, our work will really emphasize ensuring people understand the benefits of the vaccines the safety of vaccines the quality of vaccines and that we can encourage as much as possible the uh, seeking of uh, of, uh, of of vaccines rather than mandatory requirements thank you very much dr Aylward. Uh, now we're going to move to India, to Avijit uh, in AMN News. Avijit, can you unmute yourself and please ask your question? Thank you for taking my question. Uh, we just had uh, the Russian vaccine announced and uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiasm amongst people all over. So how effective is the vaccine and what is WHO's uh, comment on that? Do you want me to take that? Uh, Dr. Sumia? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for that question. The first thing is that WHO, of course, welcomes all vaccine development programs around the world. And we're very encouraged by the fact that there are so many vaccine development programs and over 30 candidates now in clinical, various stages of clinical development in phase one, two, or three clinical trials. We have also put out quite early on uh, in May this year, the criteria for what would be considered a safe and effective vaccine. It's, it's called a target product profile. And it describes the kind of uh, sort of a benchmarks that we would like an, a vaccine to meet. So a minimum of 50% efficacy in preventing infection. Uh, with a lower bound of at least 30%. So a vaccine that offers at least 30% protection at the population level, and of course, is safe. Now, safety, again, is assessed short term, but also needs to be assessed longer term because there are some side effects which you only pick up later on. So this, that is why it's so important to have these clinical trials conducted according to the standards and norms so that the data can then be examined by the experts before a decision is made on whether or not this vaccine should be licensed. So the, we, have, uh, we have started discussions now with the authorities in Russia to learn more about uh, the vaccine candidate. And we've, we've requested for the data on efficacy and safety. Um, we understand that it's gone through some preliminary human studies um, and that it is about to get into a phase three uh, clinical trial, which will really be the test of, uh, of efficacy. So we look forward to, to discussing with the, with the Russian uh, authorities as well as seeing the data that is available so far and then having a dialogue on what uh, the further needs should be and how um, further studies would need to be done. And this is why we're also uh, promoting the idea of a solidarity vaccine trial where many different manufacturers, developers, countries can participate both as trial sites to test different vaccine candidates, but also to provide the vaccine candidates into this large global multi-arm adaptive clinical trial that we think will be both a cost-effective and an efficient way of testing as many candidates as possible in the shortest period of time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, so we have no more comments in the room. I will now move to Christine from ABC America. Christine, please uh, unmute yourself and I'll go ahead and ask your question. Ah, uh, thank you. I wanted to ask about monoclonal antibodies. Could you speak to what they are, how they can be used and limitations to getting the drug to the population at large? because it sounds like a groundbreaking candidate therapeutic that may play an important role in helping curb the pandemic. Thank you in advance. Thank you, Christina. I, can, I could start, Margaret. Yes, and good, I was going to say it's Maria for you. I might, might want to add. So, uh, so monoclonal antibodies are basically highly specific antibodies uh, which act by preventing the virus from binding to the cell receptor and therefore preventing the virus from entering the human cells and causing uh, an infection. Now, monoclonal antibodies have been um, 
fairly recent technological advance, say over the last 10 to 15 years, but have been used for a number of diseases, both chronic diseases, immunological disorders, cancers, and, and more and more interest now in using these for infectious diseases. Now, as far as um, COVID-19 is concerned, there have been uh, several efforts to develop monoclonal antibodies and, and, and also there are different ways of, of doing it. You could do it in humanized mice, um, can also do it by extracting uh, antibodies from people who have recovered and then purifying them, or it could also be done uh, de novo in the laboratory. So different uh, groups, different companies have taken different approaches. And at the moment, there are several antibodies, monoclonals, either in used singly or in combination. So you can also use a combination of two or three antibodies. Uh, and this was something that was tested in Ebola and found to be very uh, effective in a clinical trial done uh, in the DRC. There were two different monoclonal antibodies that were actually found to be better than antiviral drugs in treating Ebola. So at the moment, we are aware of several clinical trials uh, for the monoclonal antibodies. The NIH is sponsoring a number of these trials, looking at these both for prevention of uh, infection. So you can give it to people who are being in contact, high-risk contacts, nursing home residents, et cetera, to see if you could actually prevent the infection. It's also being tested in early disease, uh, when people are not sick, outpatients, and also in those who've been hospitalized with uh, more moderate to severe illness. So it's being tested across the spectrum, and uh, it is one of the promising uh, therapeutics on the horizon. I think the issue that you mentioned is very important, which is the uh, possibility of scaling this and really making it accessible to people around the world, because it is a complex um, product to, to make. Uh, these facilities do not exist in uh, all parts of the world. It could also be expensive, of course, depending on what technology is used. And therefore, we're looking very closely and also talking to many partners to see how technology transfer could be uh, accomplished and how, um, if once these are found to be safe and effective, just like vaccines, you also want them to have broader access. Um, but it is, it is a, a challenge because technologically it is going to be difficult, but it can be done. And uh, it would be useful in the long run to build this capacity in countries around the world because monoclonal antibodies are likely to be therapy for other infectious diseases as well. And so this, this is a sort of platform technology that, that we really urgently need technology transfer to happen. Mary Angela might want to add something to this. Thank you, Sumya. Uh, just to highlight, uh, affordability is likely to be an issue because of cap uh, capacity of production. Nowadays, the monoclonal antibodies that are already on the market for other diseases are extremely expensive. So they are among the, the high cost drugs. So, uh, so th this is a concern. First, we have to have uh, one or two monoclonal antibodies that prove to be safe and, effect and efficacious. And we need to have scale up capacity. To, to that, uh, let me say that through the Act A, the therapeutics pillar, we have been working already on the landscaping and the, the, the possibilities to scale up capacity for some of these candidates to, who are proving to be more uh, potentially uh, effective and safe. Uh, the other issue that will come to light when, if we do have one of these drugs, uh, uh, available for COVID will be also the, the, the flexibilities around uh, the use of biosimilars that will uh, uh, potentially scale up the, 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 the availability of the product in the world. So there, there's a, there are a lot of issues. It's very good welcome news that potentially we have a good or one more than one monoclonal antibody. The other side is we need to make sure they will be uh, affordable and we would be able to scale them up. Thank you. Thank you very much. No more. Oh, there is one more intervention. I think Dr. Aylward. 
I, I think we've covered the main points on this, but um, there was an interesting part of the question was about how they would be used. And one of the discussions we've had over the last couple of uh, weeks, and the Director General has emphasized this, is that while um, vaccines are going to be an extremely important part of what we use in the fight against um, COVID, there will also be some limitations. And one we're concerned about is how well these vaccines, like others, will work in populations like the elderly and others. And this this is where sometimes an intervention like the monoclonal antibodies can be very important because potentially this may work in populations where a vaccine or others wouldn't. And that comes back to that point we've made over the last couple of weeks and again the Director General emphasized today. Um, the ACT Accelerator is really all about looking at that comprehensive integrated portfolio. We need diagnostics, we need therapeutics, we need vaccines and uh, the comments and questions just now about monoclonal antibodies really uh, really really um, emphasize that. One last point I would make is that, um, again, you asked about the limitations. You know, there's such challenges in proving that monoclonal antibodies actually work. The design of these trials is complicated because of the endpoints uh, in them, um, especially when you're looking to prevent a disease or change the course of what is usually a mild disease. And then the production uh, ones we talked about, and then even the challenges of using them and making sure they're in the right places at the right time. So again, one more, like you say, promising part of the armamentarium against uh, against this disease but like all of them none are silver bullets but together uh, hopefully it will the combination will work like one thank you very much dr. railwood dr. Shamal and dr. Swaminathan the next question for the next question we're going to Bosnia to Esmir from n1 TV Esmir can you unmute yourself and ask your question hi can you hear me very well please go ahead so my question is, uh, do you know how many countries from the Western Balkans has already joined um, COVAX? And also in line of this, um, some instances here in the Western Balkans are considering purchasing vaccines from um, Russia at the moment. Would you recommend to them to go ahead? and purchase a vaccine from Russia or to wait till we have a vaccine through COVAX accessible? Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a question for Dr. Aylward. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So um, as the Director General mentioned, I think last week and again this morning, we've had uh, 80 countries, just over countries and economies, actually express an interest to uh, join the COVAX facility. These would be self-financing countries, in addition to the 92 countries that would receive financial uh, assistance through the COVAX facility for a total of over 170. Um, this number represents countries from every every single region and area of the world. Uh, as many of the conversations are ongoing about the terms of the facility, as well as uh, negotiations around those, um, not all countries have, uh, have uh, want that their names be publicized. So for that reason, as the negotiations are ongoing, we won't be able to talk about specific countries other than some that have, have, have uh, asked and said that it they could use their names to, uh, to promote the facility and the importance of it and the confidence in it. Um, but we, don't, we prefer uh, uh, that what's available on the website gives, uh, and the Gavi websites and our own gives you an update on uh, who's joined at this point and has made their names public. Oh, also, sorry, on the point about joining COVAX as well, I want to be clear. Um, it was a bit of a milestone yesterday as the uh, terms of agreement actually went out to all potentially uh, what we call uh, fully self financing countries for uh, the COVAX facility and those are the terms now that uh, lay out uh, uh, joining whether or not you're joining through what we call the confirmed doses uh, 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 way or through option doses and to make an indication uh, confirm your intent by the 31st of August so that was an important um, uh, milestone that went out just yesterday so in the coming weeks we'll have a sense of how many actually have confirmed intent to join because again the question to, to me was um, how many have joined and at this point we're in that expression of interest with confirmation of intent by the 31st of August. 
Um, in terms of the second question about if uh, WHO recommendations reach specific vaccines, I think uh, uh, Dr. Swaminathan already answered that question, and WHO recommends vaccines through its pre-qualification or emergency use licensing uh, process, which a vaccine would have to go through before we would, um, as an organization, recommend it for, for purchase. Thank you very much, Dr. Aylwood. Uh, uh, for the next question, we go to Kai Kupferschmidt uh, from Science. Kai, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, thanks a lot. Um, I was going to ask <laughs> how many countries have actually signed up, but I guess we've um, covered that with COVAX. So I'm, I, let me ask something else. How do you see, I mean, you're pitching COVAX as a possibility to do both, right? Countries that are doing their kind of bilateral agreements might still sign up to COVAX. But doesn't that still kind of, you know, interfere with each other? I mean, basically, if you want to equitably distribute the vaccine, you know, globally, then all the vaccine that countries are hoovering up with their bilateral agreements are basically outside of that scope, right? So how, how, how do you see the kind of connection between these two different mechanisms? That's also for Dr. Elwood. Thanks, Kai. And in terms of the how many countries have signed up, you're absolutely right. But the number, again, is uh, over 170 countries now are engaged in conversations, and that represents uh, over 70 percent of the world's population. So um, uh, a huge number. And uh, per your second question, this is so important to ensuring that uh, vaccine gets out to all countries uh, at the same time in a uh, managed order. So that we reduce risk around the world as rapidly as possible and then uh, get this, um, get the world's uh, societies open again, health systems safe and, and economies open uh, as well. And um, on the question about does the new changes in the design of the COVAX facility um, affect uh, the, uh, the ability to equitably allocate uh, the vaccine, actually it makes it much better because whether or not countries have signed bilateral deals or uh, is individual countries or groups of countries, the important thing is how that vaccine is used and the order in which that vaccine is used. And what we're looking for, and, and uh, the Director General emphasized uh, last week and again today, is the more countries that join forces with the COVAX facility, the more they can work together in a coordinated manner to ensure that we roll these vaccines out at the same time and equitably across countries. Now, not just because this is the right thing to do, but what we've learned over the last few months is this is absolutely essential. No country can emerge from this crisis alone. And what we need is to get our health systems safe and protected again, first and foremost, because that and the severe disease it manages is what is having the knock-on effect with the changes in societal uh, behaviors uh, we, we've had to promote, as well as, of course, the economic uh, impact. So what we've learned really, you know, in a nutshell is that the critical thing is to ensure some vaccine gets to all countries as early as possible. And the design changes in uh, COVAX, where um, we can have the participation of uh, all countries, now uh, provides an even stronger mechanism through which we could coordinate that rollout so that all countries benefit. And most importantly, the entire world comes out of this uh, crisis as rapidly as possible. Thank you, Dr. Elwood. So now we will go to uh, Chen from China Daily. Chen, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, uh, my question is about uh, Beijing made a headline just a few days ago about uh, lifting the mandatory mask wearing uh, restrictions and uh, actually a lot of Chinese cities have already done that. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm actually based in Brussels, Belgium. So, and uh, Brussels has been added uh, by German foreign ministry just two days ago on the quarantine list actually uh, more and more by other countries too. So what, uh, I mean, according to WHO's experts view are the, uh, makes a difference. I mean, uh, considering that the whole 
population of Belgium actually is only half of Beijing's population, but a, a large area. So what measures makes the difference of policies? Thank you. Thank, thanks for the question. I, I will begin. Um, so yes, I think I think what we're seeing is that uh, a number of countries are taking a risk-based approach to the interventions that need to be used and applying them where and when necessary. So you mentioned Beijing lifting one of their tools that they are using for this in this example, the use of masks. And masks are one of the tools that can be used in the control of this pandemic, controlling of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then you mentioned another country. And so I think what we are seeing is that what countries are doing is that with the surveillance that is taking place, where they are actively looking for cases, where they're using public health measures such as isolation and clinical care for cases, um, contact tracing and quarantining of uh, contacts of known cases, use the use of masks where appropriate, uh, physical distancing, um, good information, countries are collecting data. And what they're doing is they're using that data to help advise them on what needs to be done next. Can some of these measures be lifted or do some of these measures need to be implemented again? And countries are at very different, are at different stages of the pandemic. Um, and so while many countries are seeing um, success in suppressing transmission, uh, breaking chains of transmission, um, they're able to lift some of these measures. Um, and in other countries where measures have been lifted and they're seeing a resurgence in some areas, and we've seen in a number of countries that there are clusters of cases that are happening where people are coming together and congregating, some of these measures need to be implemented more strongly again. Um, so we need to expect this. Uh, all countries need to expect this. Um, and we need to continue to use the tools that we have right now, um, which include active case finding, contact tracing, the use of masks, physical distancing, respiratory etiquette, hand hygiene, um, and then applying measures where and when necessary. We are very hopeful that countries will not have to impose nationwide measures, but could impose some perhaps smaller, uh, more geographically bound, time limited bound interventions where they are most needed to get through any resurgence in cases. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next question comes from Estonia, from Ep Ehand from Estonia Public Broadcasting. Ep, could you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Hello, thank you very much for the possibility. I would like to ask um, again uh, about uh, reopening the schools and, and transmission of uh, the virus uh, among uh, children. Uh, you have uh, said many times that there are a lot of things we don't know, but maybe you could explain once more what we do know and then what is your opinion at the moment and what would be your recommendation number one for schools? So thank you very much for the question. Um, indeed, uh, we have a lot of questions about schools, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, as many schools are starting to, to consider reopening um, for the schools for the school year. Um, there are several things that we are learning about this virus, and we are learning every day something new about this virus, um, thanks to the incredible work by public health professionals, frontline wor workers, researchers all over the world. So a special thank you to everyone conducting high quality research. With regards to schools, um, we know that schools operate in communities. They don't operate in isolation. So the big thing that we look for is what, is what does transmission look like in the community where those schools operate? So that's first and foremost to really understand. We need to bring transmission under control in the communities where the schools operate. As it relates to um, SARS-CoV-2 infection among children, um, there's three things that we are looking at. Uh, and we're working with a technical advisory group that we have pulled together to help advise us. We're working with UNICEF, we're working with UNESCO, we're working with a number of partners uh, to, to consolidate our understanding about uh, this disease in children. First of all, what type of disease is caused in children? And so luckily, the vast majority of children who are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus appear to have mild disease or asymptomatic infection, and that's good news. But there are young children, there are children that can develop severe disease, and there are children who have died from infection. The second thing that we look at is the 
the amount of infection that is actually happening among children. And this is difficult to measure because most children have mild disease or asymptomatic infection, and so they're not picked up normally with current surveillance systems. So we have zero epidemiology studies that are conducted that looks at if a child had been infected, and this is measured through antibodies. There are a number of studies that are underway, and so the data is still preliminary, and we're looking at studies that look at all the population. What we see from some of the preliminary results of the seroepidemiology studies is that there is some difference in the infection rate among the youngest children versus older children, teenagers. So we do need to distinguish children by age group. The last thing that we look at, um, the, the third thing that we look at, not the last thing, the third thing that we look at is transmission among children. And again, most schools, uh, many schools uh, were closed in, in this beginning of this pandemic. Not all countries closed their schools, but many did. And so many of the children were removed from the school system and brought home. And we know from household transmission studies that children can be infected. And we know that adults can infect children. And we also know that children can infect adults, although that appears to happen less frequently. But again, if we look at transmission, we need to break children down by age group. And there appears to be less transmission among the youngest kids versus kids who are in their teenage years. Um, so these data is preliminary, but the bottom line is that children can be infected. Most children have mild disease, although some children can have serious disease and some children can die. Children can transmit the virus, um, although there are differences in transmission rate depending on the age, with the youngest children transmitting less. Um, and, and these are studies that are ongoing. So if school, if there's transmission that's happening in a community, it can enter into the school system. So what we really need to focus on is bringing transmission down in the school system. We have outlined guidance on how schools can reopen safely. Everyone agrees how important it is that schools are operating safely. And we've outlined how that can be done in terms of physical distancing and hand hygiene stations, um, respiratory etiquette, the potential use of masks by, the, by either the workers or the children themselves. Um, and so there are a number of considerations of how the schools can be opened. But again, we really need to focus on reducing transmission in the community first. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhove. The next question comes from Elaine from Health Policy Watch. Elaine, can you unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Hi, thank you for taking my question. We saw last night um, the announcement by the US FDA that for emergency use authorization of blood plasma from convalescent patients. And I was wondering if you could explain what's the difference between that treatment and that of monoclonal antibodies, which I presume might be a bit more precise or particular, but if you could explain the two and perhaps give us a little um, thinking about how useful the blood plasma treatment may uh, pretend to be. There is a bit of a debate going on over that as well as you may know in the States. Thank you. I, I can start. This is Samia. So can you hear me? We can hear you. I, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. So convalescent uh, plasma therapy is actually something that's been used for over 100 years for various infectious diseases. And it's been effective in some and not so effective in others. So as far as COVID is concerned, again, this was one of the early therapies that uh, was uh, begun to be used. Essentially, what it involves is collecting plasma from people who have recovered from COVID and then uh, using it to, to transfuse into someone who's, who's ill. And generally, it's been used in um, severely ill patients who've been hospitalized. Um, there are a number of clinical trials uh, going on around the world um, looking at convalescent uh, plasma compared to a standard of care. And uh, only a few of them have actually reported out on results. And the results are, um, are not conclusive. I should say that the trials have been relatively small and the results um, in some cases point to some benefit but uh, have not been conclusive. And we've been tracking this uh, and uh, we do ongoing meta-analyses and systematic reviews 
to see where the evidence is shifting or, or pointing. And at the moment, it's uh, still very low quality uh, evidence. So we recommend that um, convalescent plasma is still an experimental therapy. It should be uh, continue to be evaluated in well-designed, randomized clinical trials. There are a few challenges with convalescent plasma as opposed to monoclonal antibodies that we talked about earlier. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, because they're developed uh, in a manufacturing uh, setup under GMP, uh, you know exactly the titer of antibodies and the dose that needs to be given. Whereas convalescent plasma, one of the challenges is each individual may have different titers of neutralizing antibodies after recovery. And it's very difficult to really test that and standardize that. And so it's not one standardized therapy because blood is being drawn from different patients and then being transfused. So, so that's one of the challenges. There's also limited capacity for plasma pheresis where you have to separate the plasma from the cells um, of, in the blood and not all uh, countries and not all hospitals have that kind of uh, facility. And also there's a lack of uh, donors. So there isn't enough to go around. But I think the most important question really is about its efficacy and safety being proven in randomized trials. And I hope that we will get that evidence in, in, the, in the coming weeks. Of course, one uh, countries can do emergency use uh, listing if they feel that the uh, benefits outweigh the risks and they want to provide, uh, but that's usually done while awaiting the more definitive uh, evidence which is yet to come. Thanks. Mary Angela might want to add. Dr. Ayer, we'll go ahead. He's got has something to add. Yeah, I just think one other point that we'd make with respect to convalescent therapy is like with all therapies, there can be risks. And so that's another thing that one has to consider. And in the case of um, convalescent plasma therapies, there are a number of uh, side effects from relatively mild chills and fevers that can be associated with it to more severe uh, lung-related injuries, even circulatory overload. Uh, so for that reason, um, as uh, Samya outlined, the clinical trial results are extremely important to know that we've got a clear demonstrated uh, benefit so that we can weigh both of these in considering uh, the final recommendations. Thank you very much, Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Aylward. The next question comes from Oriol from El País in Spain. Oriol, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hola, buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me. I wanted to ask, last Friday, the Spanish Ministry of Self said that in the coming hours, they were going to run out of stocks of remdesivir because of the increase of cases in Spain. They also said that they were going to try to bring units uh, from uh, research programs so that they could treat patients uh, in hospitals. As you are aware, this was a controversial subject at the time when the United States uh, announced that they were buying nearly all of the stocks until September. And it was then said that uh, there was a guaranteed supply for all countries uh, throughout the summer. Until we could go back to the normal stock levels. And then we heard that there could be a new delivery this week. But my question is, we were told it wouldn't happen, but it has happened. Another country, not a small one, the fifth in Europe, has found itself without a pharmaceutical product, which may be limited, doesn't reduce uh, mortality, but it can assist. But I wanted to ask, if this is not just a very dangerous precedent for what's awaiting us in the next next months, uh, not only in terms of vaccine, but also in medicines that could be effective and have a significant effect in reducing mortality. And when we look at unilateral you know, trade uh, operations that could endanger people in other world, other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and I heard it in Spanish, so I hope I'll, I'll be able to respond 
completely. I think you, you raise a super important question, which is when, okay, yeah, when you have a, a one provider only of a, of, a, of a medicine and this risks uh, the production globally. Uh, we do have a, a particular situation with the Rendezivir because of the, the commitment uh, in one country to buy the stocks of the originator, but we also have the bilateral agreements that the company, the, the originator, made with uh, the generic producers, and but this is, has not uh, yet uh, led to uh, mass production elsewhere. Like you said, Rendezivir is one example. It's the limited use for certain patients, severe patients, and, and it has shown only to reduce hospitalization and not not uh, reduce mortality yet. But it's a uh, it's a uh, it's one of the reasons why WU is working so hard with the partners to make sure that whatever technology is out there, there is an increased capacity to, to, to address the market needs when they come out. Thank you very much this is for raising the issue. Thank you very much, Dr. Shmuel, for that answer. So we will now go to India, to Divya from the Economic Times in India. Divya, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Hi. I just wanted to check if there is any update on the solidarity trial for the drugs. And uh, I have another question for uh, Maria. Uh, has there been any update on the Cero study from India? Uh, they were supposed to present to WHO a few weeks back. Thank you so much. I can start with the solidarity trial. I'm hearing echo. Is it okay? It's settling down, yes. I think you can go ahead. So the status uh, as of last week was that we had uh, 24 countries that were actively enrolling in the Solidarity Therapeutics trial at about 400 hospitals and over 9,000 patients enrolled. Um, as you know, we had discontinued two arms of the Solidarity trial, the lopinavir, ritonavir, and the hydroxychloroquine arms. And this was based on interim analysis, which uh, showed a lack of efficacy. So these arms were dropped for futility. And the two arms that are continuing at the moment are remdesivir and interferon beta. We're currently actively engaged with manufacturers discussing for inclusion for the next stage of this trial, looking both at anti-inflammatory drugs that can be used in hospitalized uh, moderate to severely ill patients, but also at monoclonal antibodies that could also be used for treatment as we were discussing earlier. So in the next couple of weeks, uh, we, we will be ready to announce what the next stage of the Solidarity Therapeutics trial is looking at. And we will also have the uh, data from the uh, ongoing study ready for uh, dissemination. But we've seen incredible cooperation and solidarity We've had a number of countries waiting actually to start enrolling and hopefully they will now join when we start the next phase of uh, the study. But uh, currently this is the second largest clinical trial in the world, having uh, coming close to 10,000 patients and also the largest trial that's looking at remdesivir with uh, 3,000 patients randomized to remdesivir. So hopefully we will have a definitive answer on the impact of remdesivir, both on mortality and on clinical progression. Over. Thank you, and, and Maria will answer the second part of the question. Thanks, yes, so um, as, as you mentioned, there are a number of zero surveys, zero epidemiology studies that are ongoing across the world, and there are a number that are currently being conducted in India. Um, so there are some preliminary results that have come back looking at different uh, antibody levels in different cities uh, across the country. Um, some of them finding quite high levels of seropositivity. Um, what we're trying to get a better understanding on from all of the seroepi studies that are occurring globally are the tests that are being used. So the different antibody tests measure different 
parts of the antibody response. Um, some of them do what is called IgM or IgG, and some are looking at neutralizing antibodies, and then there's a whole separate type of study that's looking at a cellular response. Um, and in India, um, we're working to better understand which ones have looked at neutralizing antibodies, um, because these are quite important for us to understand the possible protection and how long that protection will last. Um, but we work very closely with our regional office in Seattle and our country office in India. Um, and in fact, a number of other additional studies will be conducted in, in India um, as part of what we call the UNITY studies, which is using a, a standardized approach um, of, of conducting these types of investigations so that we can compare them across a large number of countries. But in India, in, in the preliminary results we've seen so far, in some areas that have been hardest hit, um, that have had high incidence levels, they've seen a higher uh, measurement of those antibodies. Thank you. I'm just double checking whether Dr. Mike Ryan wanted to add anything. No, that's fine. The next question goes to Sarah Wheaton from Politico. Sarah, could you unmute yourself and please go ahead. Sarah, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? We're not hearing you, Sarah. I'm really sorry. So oh, can we hear you now? I think. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Sorry about that. Um, about COVAX, um, you, you've asked for the um, expressions of, of, or confirmations of intent by August 31st. And is that, um, is that a drop dead deadline or if countries decide in December or March of 21, ah, uh, yeah, we probably should participate in this. Um, is that still a possibility? Thank you very much. Is one for Dr. Elwood, I think, again. Sure, and some of you may want to come in on this. So there's a couple of deadlines that are deadlines that are coming up that are important. So the 31st of uh, August is for the confirmation of intent, and then we'll have the um, uh, the financial commitment, or rather, um, <laughs> sorry, expression of intent by the 31st of August. Sorry, sorry, to be really clear. Um, and then the confirmation of intent is what happens on the 18th of September, and then by the 9th of October to um, have the initial uh, payments in place. So those are the target dates that we're working toward. Um, there are always, and you'll understand this, um, there are challenges for countries in terms of sometimes legislative process, sometimes financial processes, et cetera. So we work with countries on a case-by-case -case basis to try and ensure that uh, we can work with them toward those toward those deadlines. Um, we're still considering what would be the uh, mechanism for uh, countries that subsequently decide that they mish may wish to join. Um, some of you may want to speak to that issue if you had further information. So I think uh, the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a lot of discussions between countries, both in groups as well as individually um, with the um, secretariat of the COVAX facility discussing what the different options are. And I think as Bruce mentioned earlier, it's, it's much more flexible now and countries that have their own bilateral deals also have the opportunity to participate in the COVAX facility by having a number of different options and there are also options for countries to make either committed commitments to purchasing a certain number of doses or keeping their options by putting in, uh, by investing a little bit upfront um, for retaining the right to purchase uh, vaccines uh, at a later date. We also expect to see a large number of vaccine candidates ultimately entering into this facility starting with at least a couple in the early part of 2021. But investing in the facility now is going to give that long-term view, both the flexibility in terms of volumes, but also in terms of having a variety of different vaccines that countries could choose from to suit their own situation and their own populations. Over. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Swaminathan. And with that, I will close this press briefing because we've come up to the hour. I apologize to all of you in the queue with many questions. Please send your questions to media inquiries at who.int and we'll make sure we answer your questions or you can hold them for the next press briefing. We will also provide the audio file and as always, the text of the Director General's remarks. And now I will hand over to Dr. Tedros for his final remark. No, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Margareta, and thank you to all uh, for joining today, and uh, see you in our next uh, presser. Thank you. <laughs> Have a nice day. Yeah. Sorry?